Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Speaking and Communicating podcast. My name is Roberta, and today we are joined by a very special guest. His name is Dr. Kevin Payne. He is a social psychologist, an entrepreneur, author, and listen to this, a skydiver. And before we carry on and hear more about his exciting life and the work that he does, I'm going to give Dr. Fain an opportunity to introduce himself. Hi, Kevin. Well, thank you so much, Roberta, for that kind introduction. Uh, there, there are probably three quick things that I should develop from what you said. So one, my doctorate's in sociology and psychology. I spent 15 years as a professor. And I left the academy a decade ago to be a tech entrepreneur. And what I do now is take that knowledge and combine it with my own experience with chronic illness, both as diagnosed and as a caregiver, uh, to provide social and behavioral scientific tools that help all of us cope better with a health condition that we're not gonna be able to get away from. Okay, so you talk about chronic illness. Can you elaborate what is it that you had to face? Sure, well, in the technical sense, a chronic illness is any health condition lasting more than three months. In mm. my case, it's multiple sclerosis. Okay. And like half of all Americans, I live with a chronic health diagnosis. 18% mm -hmm. of us now have five or more of these things. In so, 80 person. Yeah, in one person, 18% have five or more chronic health diagnoses. So for those who don't know, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune condition mm -hmm. and it's a neuro neurodegenerative condition. So my immune system is attacking Attacks the myelin, itself. yeah, which is the fatty sheath around the neurons in my brain and spinal cord. Mm. So the the symptoms that we experience can be almost anything because everything we do feel think say goes through our brain and our spinal cord right. so depending on where the damage is that's what happens so i have issues with my legs for example uh, my i can't feel my legs below my knees mm -hmm. and they get a little wonky i have issues with balance and vertigo uh, but i also have cognitive fog that i have to think through Mm -hmm. I have chronic fatigue, I have chronic pain, and I have a laundry list of 30 other symptoms that come and go, uh, sometimes based without on the multiple notice. sclerosis. Uh-huh, yeah, just from the multiple wow. sclerosis. So, okay, so, so how do we, uh, if you have all of those, I want to <laughs> link the skydiver part, because <laughs> that for me yeah. was the most interesting one, because it's physically demanding. And everything right. that you have listed is physically taxing on you. So yes. explain to us the link between the two. So for me, I, I hit rock bottom. I mean, I had mm -hmm. some really awful exacerbations to my EMS. Uh, my, my career was in shambles. My family decided that this wasn't a journey they could continue with me. Wow. And I was alone. My dog even died traumatically in front of me. I mean, it was, yeah, it was really awful. So I didn't see a way forward at that time. And I thought I'm going to give myself one more chance. And for me, that chance was skydiving. I wanted to reclaim something that I had cared about. So for hmm. me, skydiving was a childhood dream. Okay. Uh, as a little kid in the seventies, I decided I wanted to be a skydiver. In the nineties, as a young man, when I was working on my doctorate, I started the training. And so I did the training. I got a handful of jumps in, but then career, family, and eventually health got in the way. So one How thing that- How did you not let those challenges prevent you from continuing with your dream of skydiving? Because I feel a lot of us, as soon as something happens, we get rattled mm -hmm. and we think, okay, that'll have to wait or- I don't think this is possible anymore well, and because of what is in front of me. And that's what I did. That's what I did to begin with. And so I had a 20 year break in there. Okay. And, and there's actually something in skydiving. You can get what's called an SRA number, 
uh, Skydiver Resurrection Award number. Okay. If you have, if you've been a skydiver and, and then you have a break of at least 20 years. Mm. So, so I've got oh, a resurrection. Okay. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm. And, and so <clears throat> too often chronic illness can become this process of a long, slow, sad slide of saying goodbye to oh. the things we loved about our lives. And I needed to get a win. I needed to reclaim something that I didn't know whether I was going to be able to do. I needed right. to challenge myself in a new way. I needed to become humble in the world again and reclaim a beginner's mindset because my illness had knocked me so far down mm. that, you know, we all carry around an image in our, in our heads that for the most part is maybe stuck in the past or, mm -hmm. or maybe focused on our, our most positive qualities. Oh, and sometimes the expectations we think we, we're supposed to live by. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes when life has, has knocked you so far down, if you want to really grow, you have to begin by acknowledging where you truly are right now, because you can't chart a path forward until you understand where you're starting from. Where you're starting from. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and so for me, I said, I want to go back and reclaim this childhood dream. Right. And the other part of it was I had become so afraid of my own body. The thing that I you feared the most. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, and no, it wasn't the diagnosis per se, because okay. for years I handled it pretty well, mm -hmm. but it was the practical on the ground experiences of you know, you have uh, an exacerbation enough times where you end up paralyzed on the floor. Right. Or, you know, you, you, you cannot think your way through a problem that you've done a thousand times before, then you feel betrayed by your mm -hmm. own body. And you begin to uh, be, be afraid of it and afraid of testing it. And so that's where I'd gotten in my life. Right. And that wasn't a life I was interested in living because I had always historically been a person who said yes to new opportunities that and had come along. Experiences and adventures. I, exactly. Are you familiar with Dr. Joe Dispenza? Uh, you know, I've heard the name, but I don't know him. Oh, yeah. Okay. So he, in, in a nutshell, had a I think it was a spinal cord injury as well. And he mm -hmm. rebuilt it. So that's what he does in his retreats, the meditations. So I'm very interested mm -hmm. to how, when you started again, what is mm -hmm. it that you told yourself? What tools did you use in order to rebuild and to say to yourself, yeah. even though my body physically feels like it cannot take me back to skydive, but I'm going to do it. I believe that I still can do it. Right. So in 2019, I went back. And at first, I didn't tell anybody at the drop zone, or drop zone is a place where people skydive. Right. Uh, I didn't tell them that I had MS. Okay. And because I was afraid that if they knew that, mm -hmm. they would say, this is not for you, go try bowling. Okay. And, and so, and, and it turns out I would have been right. You know, I was right. I found out later. So okay. I had to, you know, I started with the training again and went up and started doing the student jumps. Mm -hmm. And and how was the body feeling while doing that? Yeah. So so uh, think about it this way: I huh. I always have pain. Okay. I'm I'm you know the best I am is tired. I I, I okay. do everything I can to like get a good night's sleep and and all those things, but I start out tired and I end up mm -hmm. the day medically fatigued. Right. And that's that's just part of it. Um, and I always have parathesias, which are phantom feelings that are not actually there. Oh, and, okay. and I have, mm -hmm. yeah, so like I always itch. And, okay. and I have the feeling of random electric shocks through my body. And of course, I have numbness 
And, and for me, the most pronounced numbness is I typically don't feel my legs below my knees. And that becomes important with skydiving. So and none I, I of that scared you enough to keep you away from your childhood dream. No, because, because I, I know that I'm adaptive mm-hmm. and that humans are marvelously adaptive. And say that and again. Knew, yeah, humans, humans are marvelously adaptive. Uh-huh. Um, and and so uh, I had had 13 jumps before I came back. So I had enough experience that I knew what I was going to be in for. Right. And, and I was pretty confident that there was going to be some way for me to adapt and get creative and, and be able to do this. So we so need I, to remember that we can adapt. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And, and so we do the ground training. Now, there's something that's really interesting that happens your first couple of student jumps when you're skydiving. Mm-hmm. And now, now you're going out on what are called AFF jumps. It's, this is after some people do tandem jumps. Most people do tandem jumps now to start. That's not the way we did it in the 90s. So a tandem jump is where you are a passenger. You're attached to an Somebody experienced else. skydiver. Uh-huh. And, and they, you know, they're doing the work and, and you get to ride along and have a good time. I've seen those, yes. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so uh, you know, I, I'd never done that and and because uh, we didn't do those back in the 90s. That wasn't common. Okay. But, but coming back in 2019, I'm up there and you do your first couple of jumps, your first few jumps with two instructors. And they're not attached to you, but they hang on to you on either oh, side on as either you go side. out the door. I've seen that on TV. That's right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So, so they go out. Now, the problem is, of course, you can get separated. And you you are still responsible for deploying your own parachute and landing yourself mm-hmm. on the ground. Uh-huh. So there's there's something that happens typically with your first jump back. So they fling the door open, and and now you know the wind and the light and everything just kind of come into the cockpit, and it mm-hmm. and it and it it all becomes very crazy really quickly. And one of your instructors will lean into you very close and shout at you because you got to be heard over the wind who's responsible for your life obviously yourself and you have to and you have to answer enthusiastically affirmatively mm. i am that's right because if you don't you're not going okay fair enough so, so, yeah so, you know, we go out, we do our first few jumps and I'm going through, but my progress is slow and I'm having leg issues as I'm doing this. Mm-hmm. And after one of my jumps, it was, it was, I don't know, maybe 15, 16, 17 after I came back. Um, I'm, uh, so I've got one instructor and, and we, we do our debrief afterward on the ground and she, she comes in and you gotta remember, She's got thousands of jumps, lots of experience. And Mm -hmm. she comes in and she sits down across from me and she says, that was the most terrifying skydive I have ever experienced. What's going on with your legs? Oh. (laughs) So. (laughs) And when you first had that, what what went through your mind? What was your response? Uh, My response was, well, I guess I'm going to have to tell him now. (laughs) So, so even hearing from someone that expert in the skydiving world, you still de- were not deterred and thought to yourself, oh, I'm really putting my life at risk here with this chronic illness. Right, because, this. and here's the important thing, and this is why I was allowed to continue. Uh-huh. The important thing was, no matter how difficult I was having, uh, you know, with these issues controlling my legs, right. every time I still manage to get stable Mm -hmm. and stay altitude aware and deploy my parachute on time and so those are the minimum things you have to do to have a safe skydive so even at my worst Mm. i was still safe walk us through that in terms of us who are grounded on earth Mm -hmm. and we face our fears differently we have different challenges, not similar to yours, but when you say you were still, 
mm-hmm. um, able to do all that, how do we put that in practical terms for us on the ground? Well, in practical terms, there are uh, there are certain minimum things that you need to do to mm-hmm. get through the experience. And in this case, the experience of having a safe skydive. Right. Because the, 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 the goal of every skydive is to be able to do another skydive, mm. which means you land, land in one safely. piece. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and so the first part of the skydive is in free fall. And then everybody, you know, if you're jumping with other people, then you separate off mm-hmm. and you deploy your parachutes. So, and, and then you have to do that at a certain altitude. That's right. So mm. student jumps, you tend to pull pretty high, 5,000, 6,000 feet. And, and after we are licensed and experienced, and there are four licenses in skydiving, you get the, the, the first one, the A license, usually comes after 25 jumps. But and, well, okay, what, what I want to get at is, what do you say to yourself? Because um, I want to get to the part of mm-hmm. the inner dialogue. You know, mm-hmm. we may not be skydivers, but we face our own fears and what we think our limitations are. We may not have MS, but I, I have my own limitations, at least in my head, of what I think I'm capable and not capable of. What is it that you tell yourself in order to continue to do this despite everything that you face? I think, I think you're saying this was not my my point of challenge mm. in in my particular journey this this was not the challenge for me the the challenge for me mm-hmm. was <clears throat> figuring out if it, it was an informational challenge because for me i never doubted that i could do it what i doubted was how can and what I struggled with was how can I pick up on the right signals that the world is sending me so that I can make the best decisions in that circumstance? So, so you did not doubt your capabilities. Mm-mm. No. And if no. you had all the information, like we always say, have all the information to make the right to, to make an informed decision. So you felt mm-hmm. like the only thing that could be missing was all the information in order to make an informed decision. Right, because for me, uh, see, when, when you're skydiving, mm. your legs are an important source of information. And, you, and this feeling that you're getting mm. from your legs because mm. you're trying to keep yourself balanced and, and in control. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't get those signals. So right. I have this... So even though in the legs, yeah, right. Even though on, on that skydive, for example, she thought it was terrifying. Mm-hmm. It wasn't terrifying for me because even though I was spinning all over the place in my own head, the experience that I was having was I'm trying to figure out where I can get reliable signals at my knees. So what but I, what I learned was. I can still feel at my knees, okay. so I I was I was there trying to figure out how can I learn from the signals my tendons are giving me by mm-hmm. their tension on the back of my knees to help me interpolate what's going on with the rest of my legs. Right. And so once I did that, once I learned how to interpret the signals at my knees in the back of mm-hmm. my knees then I understood what was going on with the rest of my legs. So for me, it was about being creative and figuring out, okay, life isn't giving me these typical signals. Right. I need to figure out an alternate source of information that I can use. Okay, let's review that. So be creative when life doesn't give you the best circumstances. Is that Mm -hmm. what you're saying? Okay. Yeah. And find as much information, be resourceful with finding the information that will help you make an informed decision. Exactly. Instead of what we usually do, which is 
just jumping into, oh, I don't think I can do this. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because too often we our fear response trips. Yeah. And and sometimes it's called a fight or flight response. And and mm-hmm. really there's a lot more to it than that. It's really more like freeze front flight fight fawn flock fright faint that's a whole and, lot and of f's say that slowly yeah, I, <laughs> I call it the effort response okay and, and it's and and I, I i get into this in chapter three of my book but mm. but it's freeze front flight fight fawn flock fright faint and that's eight f's okay yeah, that's eight Fs. And, and yeah. I, yeah, I, you can add another one or two in there if you want. Right. But, but the point is, all of them are about getting distance or apparent distance between you and the thing that you think you are, are is a threat. I'm afraid of. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But here's the important thing. That response is not a fear response. We are completely wrong in what that's doing what that's doing, it's physiological arousal. And it's the same response we get when we're excited. So mm-hmm. when, when, you, when you are excited and successful, it's the same thing. So it's a challenge mm-hmm. response. And sometimes we frame it as fear. If we believe that the outcome is going to be negative, or if we believe that we are completely uncertain mm. about what can happen. If it's we think it's going to succeed, it's excitement. Right, right. It's interesting you say that, we always say that in public speaking, uh, just before you start, just before they call you on stage, you think, oh, I'm mm-hmm. nervous, because you feel all this heart pounding, your nerves tingling, mm-hmm. everything. You always say, but it's actually excitement. It's the exactly. same feeling. If you tell yourself, I'm excited, I'm about to speak, you mm-hmm. respond differently to, this must be the nerves. My heart is pounding. Oh, it must be because I'm scared. I'm nervous. Right. Then it's going to be a whole different system in your brain that works. So tell exactly. yourself you're uh, excited instead of nervous. You have to reframe the story. Mm-hmm. And, and, and really, the only way you can, you can successfully do that Mm-hmm. is through experience. Okay. So it's it's by feeling the excitement and saying, no, that's not fear, it's excitement, and right. doing it anyway, and then succeeding. Feel and, the and fear like, oh, and okay. do it anyway. Yeah, and and this, uh, there there is, chapter four of my book is called The Edge, mm-hmm. and it's about how to reframe these kinds of experiences and, and so I'll give you a, a primary example for me from skydiving. And okay. that is- And just for the benefit the, of the listeners, we keep talking about the book. Before the end of the show, you will share with us all the information pertaining to the book, the title, where to find it, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, the book and the, and the seminars and all that stuff. Everything. So okay. if, if people are watching this, they see behind me, it's, it's a picture from the cover of my book. And mm-hmm. if they're listening, then it's me on a, on a beautiful evening with, with beautiful clouds and sunrise. And I'm there in street clothes mm. and, and, uh, and I don't have a helmet on or anything so that you can see it's really me. But, yeah. and, and, and I look like just a normal person who has been, you know, dropped into an extraordinary circumstance. And that's what we feel like when we get a chronic health diagnosis or mm. when we are facing something really negative mm. that we can't get away from. And that's, that's right. the, the important part I want to emphasize. We can't get away from because all of that acute stress response that we talked about earlier mm. is about you trying to find distance between you and the thing that you find scary or challenging. But so you mean if I illness, keep running away from my problems, it's not going to help anything? Yeah, go figure. <laughs> And certainly for me, and the thing mm. that I was most scared of, my own body, I can't get away from. No. So, so you must figure out a way to accommodate this, this scary thing and reframe this scary thing. So in that picture, mm-hmm. I'm at 5,000 feet when that picture was taken. Okay. And I'm headed toward the earth at 120 miles an hour. 
Hmm. What that means in practical terms is if I do nothing at this point, my life expectancy is 27 seconds. I will literally die in 27, in 27 seconds. seconds. Yeah, because I will impact the earth and the earth will win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, gravity. And so, yeah, gravity. It's the law. Go figure. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I've got my hands up to my head, up to my right. forehead, and I I'm about to sweep them out in a broad gesture. Mm -hmm. And that's something that every skydiver will recognize. And I explain it in the prologue. It's called the wave off. Okay. And the wave off is the point in the skydive where we've decided we're going to end the free fall portion. And I am now warning everybody else in my airspace that I'm going to actively choose life. I am going mm -hmm. to save myself by deploying my parachute. So I wave off and I deploy. Okay. okay. And what I want people to understand is no matter how dire things seem, mm -hmm. first of all, you're going to have to save yourself. Because it's with you. If it uh, if it's yeah. me, it's up to you. No one's coming. Nobody to else you. is going to do it. No. And, and literally in a skydive, nobody's coming to save me. Mm -hmm. I must save myself. And so I am choosing life and I'm deploying my parachute even under extreme circumstances. So I want people to understand that they may feel like their life is in free fall right. with a chronic diagnosis. And they may feel that there is, is nothing good, but when you pick up the book, when you go to one of my seminars, when you do uh, you know, the stuff that Your Life Lived Well does, yeah. then you are actively choosing life. And, and humans, when we're crafting our own story, mm. you know, humans are narrative creatures. And I think that is the most human thing that we do. We build stories. Yeah. And stories are pre-rational. They, they are older than our rational brains. They have been with us for... But forever. how do we craft one that benefits us and doesn't paralyze us, so to speak? Because I think, especially when the circumstances look dire, mm -hmm. remember earlier you said, be creative. That's not the first thing right. that appears in your mind, to be creative. Right. So uh, let's go back to that, that, that uh, acute stress response, that hmm. freeze, front, flight, flight. That first stage is freeze. And, and what that is, is called hypervigilance, okay, in the technical mm -hmm. sense. And hypervigilance, our senses get really aware and we pause. And the first and, pause. Yeah, it's that first pause. Mm -hmm. And what, what we have to do first is learn to recognize that pause and extend it just a little bit. Because that's where you can insert your forebrain, your, your, your rational thinking, right? Instead of, because usually we pause for a second and then we panic. And then we panic. And then we go start going down that list of all those other Fs. And, mm -hmm. and none of those are rational. None of those are, are seeing the big picture. Yes. So... When you, when you practice recognizing the pause, that is an opportunity for you to insert your higher thinking mm -hmm. and more important, your agency, your active choice. And if you want to rebuild your own story, yes, you rebuild your own story by exerting choice. Not, not by just feeling responding to reacting exactly actually. reacting because to just if, what is there exactly emergency, because if you emergency. allow yourself yeah oh. if you allow yourself to to continue cascading down those f responses mm -hmm. you're not acting you are reacting reacting and and you are are short circuiting your higher brain so in that pause We've got to learn to practice. Oh, okay. I recognize it now. Mm -hmm. And now this is an opportunity for me to assert my 
agency, my selfhood, my action, my choice by actively choosing life and choosing the direction of my own story. Okay. And you may be right, you may be wrong. Yes. But now you're starting to build a better identity because it's an identity you're choosing. And that's something you can learn from and that's something you can build on. So you build by choosing and by mm -hmm. acting, actively choosing instead of just reacting. The reaction sounds to me like just reacting is not building. You just- No, you know, it's not. Putting band-aids on everything just temporarily. Exactly, because mm -hmm. it doesn't build your own story. It doesn't build your identity. Mm -hmm. it, it teaches you that you are a reactive person without control in your own life. That's what you're learning. Not an ideal, not an ideal at all. Yeah. No. So living life in an emergency mode. So give let let so let's have three practical tools, three tips you can share with us starting today. What we can do when okay. faced with fear, <clears throat> sorry, does circumstances and how to actively choose, like you've just explained to us. Mm -hmm. and, and showing up for ourselves and realizing, you know, realizing that we are here to, to save ourselves. Nobody's coming to save us. What are three things that we can start actively doing today? Okay, so the first one, I will reemphasize recognizing and practicing the pause. Huh. So when you start feeling those physiological signs mm -hmm. of arousal, okay, you've got a choice at this point to frame it as fear or yeah. as excitement. And the only way you can do that is by insert, you know, pausing mm -hmm. to allow your forebrain to catch up with what's going on in your basal brain mm -hmm. that is, you know, pushing you forward. It's urging you. It becomes really insistent and it's saying, do something now, 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 now. Yeah, yeah. And you've got to say, <laughs> whoa, yeah, wait a minute. You know, 99% of the challenges we face in our modern world are not a saber toothed tiger in the underbrush that's going to eat us. You know, <laughs> even though we think they are, not, but okay. <laughs> even though we think they are, because that's the only way that our basal brain can, can mm. uh, frame this. So practice the pause. Pause. And, and use it to insert yourself into the process and not get carried away. The second thing okay. is be kinder to yourself. Oh, that's a big one. Be kinder to yourself. Yeah. Yes, I always have a question when it comes to this. How mm -hmm. is it that if a best friend is having a problem, we can say the kindest, most caring things, be there for them. Mm -hmm. But when we are faced with something, that's not the first thing we do to ourselves. Yeah, that's, and, and that's a really important point. And you know, what I would, what I would say is that in our culture now, we've become, especially in the last couple of decades, much more aware mm -hmm. of what it takes to have good relationships with other people. Yes. And there's a lot more information out information. there in the public discourse. Mm -hmm. But what I would say, as a social and behavioral scientist who's done this for 30 years, mm -hmm. what I would say is everything that you know about building a good relationship with other people also applies to building a good relationship with yourself okay so think yes. about this. why are we hard on ourselves though is it a perfection thing or thinking if 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 i punish myself it's going to force me to do better. what is this that we do oh wow okay so this is this is like a deep topic in chapter two okay and what what it is uh, really short here is mm. that we are not a unified self Identity is the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and it's us trying to make sense of what I call a society of mind. So our society of mind is lots and lots and lots of little characters in there. Okay. And they're not fully formed identities, but they, they each are little brain systems that are bent on making one particular kind of decision. Okay. And some of them are cave children. And, and those are the ones that are running the fear response. Mm -hmm. And they are really loud and they have a really 
constricted view of the world and they operate really fast and everything is really urgent for them. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and they need to be heard because in their view and literally they can't see anything else. You've got to engage your central Only executive what's here now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're concrete. They're right here right now. And, and, and that's fine. They have their place but they can't be driving all the time. No. And, mm -hmm. and what we have to understand is that there are other characters in here, maybe that we've learned as little children that are some of our earliest ways of seeing the world. Mm. And as we mature, as we grow up, these characters inside of us don't mature. They stay frozen where they were when they were formed. What matures right. is like, we can look at maturation like adding layers to the onion so as how we get do we, older. How do we go back to them mm -hmm. when, especially during times when we need to tap into them so that we don't give in to the fear? Do you, do you have anything you can share? Do you do meditation, you know, silence? Well, I'm an in, yeah, I'm an enthusiastic meditator. It's, it's been part of my life for decades. Right. And and I start every day with meditation and mm -hmm. I, I return to it periodically throughout the day. And I mm -hmm. do what I call mindful minutes. So yeah. I just I just check out for a moment and, and do six deep breaths and mm -hmm. and practice awareness and and gratitude and then go on with my life. And because and, I feel like the when you were saying instead of panicking pause so that mm -hmm. the wiser mind comes to the forefront mm -hmm. it's not going to do that if this one is always constantly creating right for a and, story and what you so silent. and what you do yeah hmm. well it's okay so here's the thing you can't force it to be quiet look at it this way think about when you have little kids you know hmm. my kids are grown up now but you know when they were little when you tried to forcefully shush them it doesn't work <laughs> it doesn't work and that's in that way it doesn't mm -hmm. work with our cave children in our own mind right now mm. you have to acknowledge them you have to say yes uh -huh. i hear you i appreciate what you're saying but now i'm going to now take is not the time other views i'm going to take some other views into account mm. and we're going to do this thing anyway and you hang on with me and trust me and we're going to succeed. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to learn that we can actually do this thing. What a beautiful inner dialogue. Wow. Yeah. And <laughs> should be because we do every day. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're, you're not disrespecting it mm -hmm. because that's a part of you that is, that is honestly within the best of its capacity, trying to protect you. To be there for you. That's right. So yeah. it does serve its and, job. It's just that there are times when it needs to pause and you call on a different voice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so you can't, you can't get down on it for, no, for no. trying to do this important job. Right. You have to say, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. And we're going to try this. Okay. And I think we're going to succeed. We may not, but I think we're going to succeed. So hang on. And, and let's learn from it. Do you think that self-development and motivational speakers, the self-development experts, do you feel like that's sometimes part of the missing link in pushing people to be the best they can? Because then you either have people, you'll, you'll have a, a certain percentage that succeeds and, and does that. And then you have just the average person struggling because they either become too hard on themselves when they feel like I'm not doing this thing that this expert said I must do. I'm not effective in it. It's not working. Do you feel like there's, there's that element that's missing? Okay, so I, I, I have a, a wildly ambivalent attitude toward uh, self-help and motivational speaking. Mm, mm. And, and imagine my surprise when I came to the point in my life where I felt like I had to somehow bring my science 
based perspective into that arena. Into it, that's right. Right? And because quite frankly, a lot of it is fluffy smarmy BS. <laughs> and and it is. And and what's important to me, and this is where I was consciously very different. I'm not a guru. I'm not a leader. I'm not any of that stuff. I am a guy with multiple sclerosis who is trying to do the best I can out of my own life and who happens to have spent the last 30 years of my life studying people and teaching people. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to marry those two together to help people, not by providing one way. Right. Okay? Because that's what the majority of the population is facing and can relate to. That's so what, that's but that's what, what that's, we want to know. That's what our, our inner cave children want because they see the world in that really oversimplified way. Mm. But the problem is if you jump on the next one way, it may work for a little bit, but then it's going to fail. In the long term, it, it will does. fail. It will always fail. And so you internalize the message that something is wrong with you because it failed for you. When 5% and, and, of the people that were at the same seminar were able yes. to succeed. So what is wrong with me? Yes, exactly. And that mm -hmm. is the wrong, and, and it's nothing wrong with you because here's the thing. If you look at the research, there are 150 ways to change a behavior. Oh. All of them work for someone only some of them will work for you. So they are the, the work for you. Don't compare yourself to another person. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And understand that what works for you now may will not, not work next week. Not may not, will not work for you in six months or six years because you're going to change yep. and, and you're you know, your goals are going to change, your environment changes. So mm -hmm. what I'm interested in with my book and my seminars and what I'm doing is I want to show you how to make better decisions about how to make these choices for yourself. Okay. Because when you are properly educated, you are the, you are the person who can save yourself. But okay. you need to understand for a person like me in my circumstances, what is the most likely thing that I can do? Mm -hmm. And how can I recognize that that's being successful? And if not, what's the next thing that I try? So that it's not this haphazard, random. It becomes too abstract and, you know, something, as I said earlier, practical tools, things that people can mm -hmm. actually do on a daily basis. So before yeah. we wrap up, let's just summarize. We need to pause okay. when circumstances are dire. Mm -hmm. Be adaptable. We mentioned this earlier, but let's come back to it. Be adaptable because humans are adaptable. What will work yep. for you now will not work in the future. So be adaptable. And most importantly, respect and love the survival instinct that, that, mm -hmm. that has the narrow vision, but it there's a place and a time for it. Yeah. Be kind. Be kind. And, and not just... And not just be kind to yourself, be mm -hmm. kind to your future self. Be because your future self is the one who's going to have to live with the consequences of the bonehead decisions you make today. That's right. And be an agent, choose, actively choose instead of reacting. Thank you right. so much, Dr. Pint. But before we close, we would like you to share where we can find all this information. On you can go, the life you want. yeah, you can get everything at yourlifelivedwell.co. Let's say and that slowly. Even, you know, your life lived well dot co. C -O. C -O. Okay. Your yep. life lived well dot co. Mm -hmm. All the information we've discussed today and more is there. All the information. You get 100 pages free of the book. You can see mm -hmm. what seminars are coming down the pike and you can mm -hmm. do. You can see my own podcast. You can right. uh, guest appearances. I mean, blog, you name it. There's tons of stuff there. Excellent. This has been such a wonderful conversation, very informative, very transformational. And I hope, for, I hope that next time we will be able to have a chance to chat with you again. Well, I've been delighted and, and thank you so much, Roberta, for having me. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Kevin. Bye.
Be well.